Hello everyone and welcome to this session. My name is Kirsten Small, I'm a specialist obstetrician and gynaecologist and I'm a member of the Transforming Maternity Care Collaborative. In this session I'm going to be speaking to you about intrapartum cardiotocograph or CTG monitoring, commonly known as electronic fetal monitoring. And I'll be addressing the questions as to whether it's effective, fruitful and whether it should be mandatory. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am on Kumba Meri land, the traditional owners of the um, Gold Coast in Queensland in Australia, uh, and acknowledge that many of you are also on traditional lands wherever you're meeting with us today. The plan for this session is that I'm going to begin by reviewing the evidence regarding intrapartum heart rate monitoring. Then we'll be considering who is it that benefits from the use of CTG monitoring and discuss decision making about intrapartum fetal heart rate monitoring. Let's begin by addressing the question whether CTG monitoring is effective by looking at the research evidence. I'm going to start with women that are considered to be at low risk. The, all of the research around uh, intrapartum fetal heart rate monitoring categorises women into high and low risk categories when it's conducting the research in this way. So there is a Cochrane review which has looked at all of the randomised control trials where women were randomised either to intrapartum CTG monitoring or intrapartum intermittent auscultation, IA. The findings from the Cochrane review show that for women at low risk, there is no difference in perinatal mortality, regardless of the particular monitoring method that's used. There is no data at all about whether it benefits children from the point of view of reducing the incidence of cerebral palsy. We do know that there is a doubling of the caesarean section rate when CTG monitoring rather than intermittent auscultation is used during labour, and no statistically significant difference in the instrumental birth rate. Most of the research that makes up the Cochrane Review is now quite dated and a more recent retrospective cohort study from the United States of America looked at a population of 1.5 million women who had either received CTG monitoring or intermittent auscultation and they were women who were considered to be at low risk at the onset of their labour. Again, we see no difference in the perinatal mortality rate, an increase in the caesarean section rate, and in this particular study, there was also an increase in the instrumental birth rate. I suspect that there's no information, well, this information will not come as a surprise to most of you, that you are probably aware that for women considered to be at low risk for poor perinatal outcome, that CTG monitoring offers no advantages over intermittent auscultation. Let's look next at what the evidence says about women who have risk factors. So to be included in a um, randomised control trial of a population of women who are considered to be at risk, then you needed to have a risk factor. And that included conditions such as the presence of meconium staining of the lycor, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, that there had been an abnormality of the fetal heart rate detected on intermittent auscultation at the time that the worm first presented, antepartum hemorrhage, breach presentation, multiple pregnancy, the things that we commonly recognise that increase the chance of a poor perinatal outcome from occurring. So the Cochrane Review has summarised all of the trials that have been conducted for women considered to be at high risk, again comparing CTG use with the intermittent auscultation during labour and there is no difference in the perinatal mortality rate. So CTGs do not prevent babies from dying when women are at high risk. Interestingly, the cerebral palsy rate was more than double in women who were monitored by CTG during labour. Now that comes from one particular study where the risk factors were um, that the woman was in preterm labour. So the best evidence that we have at present is that for women who are in preterm labour that the use of CTG monitoring is associated with a, a, a significant increase in the risk that their child will develop cerebral palsy. Again we see an increase in the caesarean section rate which is almost double and no sig statistically significant difference in the instrumental birth rate. My own research with my co-authors was a systematic review of the non-experimental evidence. So we looked at, at large data sets um, that have previously compared women who were monitored by CTG and, or monitored by intermittent auscultation. Um, and once we identified the best 
conducted studies that had taken steps to minimise the risk of bias explaining their answers, we also found that there was no reduction in perinatal mortality when CTG monitoring was used for women who were considered to be at high risk. That particular set of information may be new to some of you who are not um, familiar with the idea that CTG monitoring doesn't produce benefits for women who are at high risk. During the past 10 or 15 years there's been pressure to increase the um, addition of extra technologies on top of the CTG to see if we can make the CTG more effective. So we've had the CTG plus fetal blood sampling, the CTG plus central fetal monitoring, plus ST segment analysis of the fetal ECG, plus fetal oximetry and plus computerised CTG analysis. All of those have had some form of research done to demonstrate whether they improve perinatal mortality or not. Some have had high level large randomised control trials, some just small collections of observational data, but none of them have demonstrated improvements in perinatal mortality compared to standard CTG use alone. So to answer the question, is CTG monitoring effective? On the data that we have at present, the answer to that has to be no, it is not. It certainly doesn't improve outcomes for the baby. It increases the chance of surgical birth for the mother and that carries risks for her. Is it fruitful? Well, clearly not for the baby or for the mother, but it is for some people. Who is CTG monitoring fruitful for? So the makers of CTG technology clearly benefit from ongoing low levels of poor outcome because it drives ongoing use of the technology um, and it's now very widespread throughout high income countries and is beginning to be introduced in low income countries as well. Not only has there been more instances of use of technology but the technology is of much higher order so we see computerised systems um, that are now incorporated into electronic health records and they're very expensive and complex systems. The providers of CTG education also benefit well because if you continue to have a low number of poor outcomes ticking away in the background, you can make a strong argument that you need to educate your workforce. Of course, educating the workforce in the appropriate use of a technology that itself does not work will not solve the problem and therefore there will be continuing drive to educate people in an attempt to make the technology work. My own research interest has been in central fetal monitoring, which is where the digital information from the CTG is transmitted to a um, screen somewhere centrally within the healthcare service so that multiple CTGs can be viewed by a single person at a single place. Now that has big advantages for midwives and nurses, depending on which maternity system you're working in and who the primary carer is, in that they can attach the woman to the monitoring equipment and then they can leave the room while the CTG trace continues to be collected. And that um, means that they can provide care for more women than would be required if they needed to stay present in the room and perform intermittent auscultation. Maternity services particularly like that because it means that they can provide services to the same number of women for a reduced level of staffing which is cost effective for them. Lawyers clearly like the use of CTG monitoring because they can find somebody who can argue either side of the equation as to whether this CTG was acted on correctly or not acted on correctly um, and whether they're representing the clinician or the person who's experienced the poor outcome, they will generate a financial reward from having done so. Obstetricians benefit from CTG monitoring. Uh, we are typically regarded as being the final arbiter of decisions about how to interpret and act on CTGs and that maintains us in positions of respect and authority within healthcare systems. Obstetric organisations are also typically those that uh, generate policies about CTG use and are the providers of CTG education. And so Having, um, having expertise around CTG monitoring positions obstetric, or, obstetric or, organisations as being authoritative, respected organisations and if they are um, prov providing CTG education, which is the case here in Australia, generates a significant amount of, of income to support obstetric organisations. 
So is CTG monitoring fruitful? For some people, yes, it clearly is. Should CTG monitoring be mandatory? The answer to that is clearly no. There is no benefit. And even if there was, it remains the birthing woman's choice to decide what happens with her body. Women do want to participate in decision making around fetal monitoring. Uh, Hindley and colleagues in 2008 in the UK asked women and 97% said that they wanted to be involved in decision making about intrapartum fetal heart rate monitoring. But 94% of them were not offered a choice to do so. Women considered that it was important to be provided with information about fetal monitoring so that they could make that decision. But 65% of them said that they were not given that information to help with decision making. More recently in Australia, Thompson and Miller surveyed women and 95% of the women they surveyed had reported that they had used intrapartum CTG monitoring. Only 9% of those agreed that they had made an informed decision that that was what they wanted to have happen for their labour. The majority of women in that study and that I see in clinical practice have what I call uninformed acquiescence. What does that look like in practice? So that's when a clinician says to the woman, leap up on that bed over there, I'm just gonna pop the CTG on for you. Or they'll say, because you have, insert risk factor here, you have to have this monitoring done. And that's the end of the conversation. There's insufficient information around the pros and cons of the use of fetal monitoring, and there's no space allowed for the woman to recognize that this is a decision that she can participate in. The World Health Organization says that we all have a right to health and that the right to health includes the right to control one's own health and body and to be free from interference. So it's clear that women have a right to determine whether and what form of fetal monitoring will be used during their labour. As clinicians we have responsibilities to provide accurate evidence-based information and then to provide care according to the decisions that that woman makes. Now that's clearly not what's happening in the majority of people's practices around the world at this particular point in time. I would like to encourage you to become part of the change. I think we have reached a point in history where we now recognise that we are doing more harm than good in many of our intrapartum practices for women. At a very small level, you can begin by changing the conversations that you have with women. Let them know that CTG monitoring is a choice. Provide them with information and support them to make decisions about what they want. Have conversations with your colleagues about the evidence base and share information around the fact that there is no proven benefit from CTG use, even amongst women who have risk factors. If you are in a managerial position within an organisation, review what your policies and procedures say. Are they supporting your clinicians to support women to make decisions or do they require the clinicians to make the women have a particular approach to fetal monitoring? If you are involved in case analysis after there's been a poor outcome, make sure you're applying the evidence there. So for example, I see um, situations where somebody who's used intermittent auscultation and then there's been a poor outcome are immediately judged to have provided um, unprofessional care simply on the basis that they didn't use a CTG when clearly the evidence shows that the use of the CTG would not have improved that outcome. Finally, we need broad systems level change. It is very difficult for clinicians to be able to genuinely offer women choice as we're often held to account um, for um, ensuring that women take particular actions that are seen to be in the best interests of the organisations that we work for or for us individually as clinicians in order to avoid uh, regulatory or legal consequences. We need to hold our professional organisations to account and expect of them that they generate advice which is evidence aligned, which supports respectful woman-centred care. Thank you very much for listening today.